Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. Greetings, my name is Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Glad that you're here with us today for this time of scripture and the word. Our scripture comes from Romans chapter four, verses 13 through 25. And it says this, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said of him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what God had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him as righteous were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. May God add his blessing to our reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this day, for your word, for the opportunity to spend a little time here today, uh, looking into it, uh, trying to understand uh, Paul and his praise of Abraham and how that all fits together. And we ask your, your wisdom and your guidance as we undertake this. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. 
Well, good morning or good afternoon whenever you, you tune in on this. Uh, so there's a lot here and uh, it's Paul and Abraham and uh, talking about faith uh, versus the law. And so we want to jump into all that. One key phrase uh, that we read was against all hope. And I like that phrase because it, it sort of brings to mind that there was a path and, that I was hopeful of and I tried on my own and through my own, uh, you know, abilities to make something happen and it's just not going to work. Uh, and so against all hope seems to indicate that uh, God steps in to, uh, to do something miraculous, do something we can't do. Uh, and so Paul's going to talk about putting our trust in God and not in ourselves uh, as we look at this uh, passage together. And so uh, here in, in Romans, Paul wants to tell us about Abraham. Um, maybe more correctly, Paul wants to praise Abraham and lift him up uh, as, as an extraordinary person. And uh, so to do that, Paul's going to suggest that there are two kinds of people in the world, Jews and Gentiles. And so in Romans chapter 1 through 3, he talks about Jews and Gentiles. Uh, and it's almost like he's uh, introducing two opponents uh, in a wrestling match. So in that spirit, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> uh, Paul says in this corner are the Gentiles. And if you read through chapter one and two, uh, they're awful, terrible, no good, very bad people who've done terrible things and stand greatly in need of redemption. Uh, there's really no redeeming value to them at all. Uh, and, and so that's one corner. And over in the other corner are the Jews who are very self-righteous and feel protected. Um, and they, uh, they believe that they have this exempt from punishment sort of uh, thought, uh, that they have that get out of jail free that we read about here, that they're children of Abraham. And so because they're chosen of God, uh, they have no stain on them and nothing can touch them. And so in the third chapter, Paul sort of attacks that. Uh, and in ch uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, what advantage is there to being a Jew? And you can hear all the Jews saying, well, it's our birthright. It's what God chose us. And so he's going to protect us. He's going to watch over us. And verse 9 of the third chapter, Paul answers that question, what advantage is there to being a Jew? And he says, none. And you can again hear all the Jews going, what? You're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. Then in verse 10, he says, says, no one is righteous, not even one. And, um, uh, and then in verse 20, uh, Paul really drops the bomb and he says, no human being will be justified by the works of the law. No human being will be justified by the works of the law. Well, the whole Jewish uh, uh, religious system is based on adherence to a law, and that uh, adherence to that law does, in fact, uh, save you and justify you. So uh, this wrestling match is going back and forth. The Gentiles have been blasted. Now the Jews have been blasted. So who's going to win? How is this going to come about? In verse 21 of the third chapter, uh, Paul says this, But now... And so he's about to announce the winner. And so is it going to be the Jews or the Gentiles? He says, not the Jews or the Gentiles, but a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. And so, oh my gosh, the winner is God. God's created a new path. It's not through the Gentiles wandering. It's not through the Jews' legalism uh, that the match is going to be won. It's a, it's a whole different path that God has created, and it's apart from the law. So just pause for a second and, and kind of think through Paul's life. Paul is a legalist. He fought for the... the uh, the Jewish faith. Uh, he attacked uh, Gentiles and the early Christians for their, uh, uh, their wrong thinking, uh, even to the point where he persecuted them and even put some to death, stoned them. And so, apart from the law, 
Paul has uh, committed his whole life to the law, but apart from the law, and it, these are Paul's words, he's had this massive transformation of where he was and where he is now, uh, uh, in part through the, uh, the teaching and leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, and God's just coming into his life to uh, get him on the right track. It's a grace that Paul received that he, he knows he'll never uh, be worthy of. Uh, it's something that was a gift to him, Not, nothing he earned like he was trying to do in the first part of his life. All his life, he'd been laser-focused laser on this legal pursuit, uh, trying to uh, discover the law, trying to adhere to the law, trying to tell people, make people, bully people, uh, control people into following the law that he understood it to be, uh, and attacking those who didn't see things his way. And so in, it's incredible that in chapter 3, verse 28, uh, he also says this, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Wow, that's amazing. So, if the, the Gentiles are in need of redemption, and if the Jews are just as much in need of redemption, and, as it says, if the old way of finding redemption through the law isn't going to get the job done anymore, then what do we do? And, and who is somebody that can guide us? So it's at this point, all of this background work that Paul uses to get to Abraham, to lift Abraham up as a model. And again, this has to be pretty hard for Paul, I think, because Paul, I think, kind of liked to fancy himself as that model, as that person everybody would look to. But it's not Paul, and he's having to uh, share the spotlight or just totally give the spotlight over to Abraham. And Abraham couldn't have been more different in the way he lived his life, the way he acted, uh, than, than Paul. Um, so Paul turns to Abraham in, in chapter 4, verse 13, says, The promise to Abraham and his descendants did not come through the law, but it came through faith. So again, this phrase, against all hope. God does something that uh, Paul couldn't do on his own that you and I can't do on our own. And Abraham understood that. Abraham followed in faith uh, on a path and trajectory that Abraham never could have pulled off on his own. And so he didn't try. He just simply trusted God. And for Paul, that was remarkable that uh, Abraham is not pursuing some sort of legal uh, prescription uh, and that Abraham is gracious to the people around him, uh, not judgmental, not mean, not angry, not trying to destroy them, not trying to control them and their thoughts and their attitudes. So, uh, last week, Dr. Davis talked about the temptations of Jesus. Three temptations. Each temptation uh, Jesus confronts with Scripture uh, and um, with that uh, and prayer, he uh, just kind of tosses Satan out the door. And for a lot of people, a lot of us, uh, we use that as a model. Uh, if we're tempted, we just quote scripture uh, and just do what Jesus does. Uh, the whole, what would Jesus do, WWJD uh, craze uh, is kind of based on that. Uh, the, the problem is that we're, we're not Jesus, right? Um, and, and you and I know that pretending to be Jesus is, is, a, is hard work. We can't keep up and we, even with the help of the Holy Spirit, we fall often. And, and it's important to, to recognize, though, that Jesus, although he knew the law, appreciated the law, was not a legalist. Uh, Jesus is able to quote the law, but when he deals with people, with you and me, uh, he leads with grace. 
Over and over and over and over, he leads with grace. In the third chapter of the Bible, Adam and Eve succumb to the devil uh, and the temptation there in the garden and lose the garden, but God still deals with Adam and Eve in a grace-filled manner. In Jesus' greatest hour of need, the disciples desert him, but when Jesus catches up with them a few days later, his attitude and his actions uh, convey this incredible, amazing grace. Israel's greatest king uh, commits adultery and murder, uh, both Ten Commandment prohibitions, but yet God is still gracious in dealing with David. Uh, Moses, the deliverer of Israel from the Egyptian, commits murder, and God is still gracious to Moses. Paul persecutes the, the church, and God is gracious uh, to Paul. And that's, that's part of the struggle that, that we have uh, because we, we do have both. And Paul is not diminishing that as well. either. There's an appreciation for the law. But what Paul did in his early ministry is he weaponized the law. He used the law uh, to create a narrative uh, where he could go out and intimidate, bully, persecute, even kill people. Um, and that's, a, that's a, 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 a big problem. The law, the law, kind of like if you think in bowling terms, the law's the lane, uh, the pins are set down, there's a goal, we have to have kind of boundaries and things uh, to shoot for, uh, but grace is kind of like the uh, bumpers in the gutters that uh, just make life easier uh, and help us get back on track instead of uh, being destroyed. Paul's way of serving God was built on accusation and judgment. Abraham's way of serving God was built on grace and faith. Some of us like the law because, like I said, it creates a path. But the temptation is always uh, to use that path uh, to, uh, to, uh, to wreak havoc over all of those around us. We stand on uh, certain passages in the Word uh, to bully and intimidate people. Uh, in the Old Testament, if someone transgressed the law, the response was often to take them to the city gates and stone them with the phrase, purge the evil from among us. And that's still popular, as sad as it is, still popular theology today. We decide uh, who is good and bad based on our selective uh, set of laws that we cherry pick from misreading the red letters of Jesus and we use that uh, misinformation uh, to exclude people who are, look different, who dress different, who act different, who speak different, who understand politics different who live in other parts of the city or county or state or region or nation or world. And it's exactly what Paul is recorded as doing and proclaiming in the first part of Acts. And it's important that we recognize he's repenting of that. He's saying to those actions, I was wrong. That was not the way that I should have read the scripture. That was not the way I should have treated people who were different from me, who saw the world in a different light. Too often we pick up Paul as an example from this early time and say that gives us the right to do the same sort of things. But here in Romans, Paul is repenting of that. I was wrong. That wasn't right. And Paul is now lifting up Abraham as the standard of a faithful person because Abraham is the epitome of faith and grace. Not a legal bone in his body, not an entitled bone in his body. He lived his life with humility and grace and faith. You know, just for fun, uh, later today, you might go back and read 1 Corinthians 13. It's commonly referred to as the love chapter. Uh, and, it, and read it through one time uh, as Paul, because Paul's the author, as Paul uh, using Abraham as the model 
for how we ought to live our life. And so here are the characteristics that Abraham modeled, and he's lifting Abraham up. And then go back and read it as a lament. Uh, all of the things that are said in there that, uh, uh, that were mistakes in the ways of thinking and acting, uh, attribute that to Paul's lament. I did this, and I'm sorry. That wasn't the way I should have acted. And so why does Paul spend so much time here on law and grace and how we live and, and the ways in which we weaponize the law and mistreat people, try to control uh, family, spouse, kids, uh, business associates? Uh, why does Paul spend so much time here? I think because it's really important to get uh, the difference uh, what God is trying to do in our lives because it's not only a spiritual pursuit, uh, but it impacts us relationally, economically, uh, emotionally. Uh, every area of our life is impacted by this idea of legalism versus grace. Relationally, look at some of the stories in the New uh, Testament. Uh, the story of Martha and Mary comes to mind where Martha is getting ready for a meal. Mary's talking to Jesus. Martha is mad uh, because Mary's not following the rules of hospitality. <laughs> and she complains to Jesus and Jesus says to Martha, relax. Uh, rules are fine and there's a place for all of that, but Mary's chosen a different path right now and it's okay. Do you hear the grace in that? Do you hear the compromise between legalism and grace? Uh, it's not always necessary to follow your particular set of rules if it comes at the expense of a relationship with somebody that you care about. In the story of the... Uh, the, the neighbor or, or the lawyer confronting Jesus about who is my neighbor. Jesus tells a story about a Samaritan who does good work and then says, who, who appeared to be the, the, the neighbor? Well, was it the Pharisee or the Sadducee or the religious leader or was it the Samaritan? And so painfully, the lawyer says it, it was the Samaritan um, that showed grace. And so uh, the legal translation of that was that we weren't supposed to have anything to do with the Samaritans. When Jesus talks to the woman at the well, he's not supposed to do that. But Jesus leads with grace and suspends the rules from time to time in order to treat people with kindness and love and respect. And he asks us to do the same thing. That's exactly what he asks Paul to do. He doesn't ask Paul to forget all the laws, but he asks Paul to keep that in perspective uh, when he's dealing with people and when he's traveling to different areas of the world where people think and act differently than he does and to show some respect and some consideration for who people are and where they come from and what's important. Uh, Paul doesn't get to impose <laughs> his particular bent on the world and theology and culture on everybody just because he thinks he's right. Economically, uh, the same struggle exists. We have rules of economics that seem to benefit just a few. And so what would it look like to, to offer grace in the world? I love what John Wesley says, earn all you can. Uh, knock yourself out, have fun. Earn all you can. If you're super ambitious, great. Then save all you can. Be good stewards of what you have. Don't just throw it away. Uh, but then give all you can. And so Wesley holds that in balance. Earn as much as you can, but also be generous. Uh, recognize the opportunity uh, to care and share and be a blessing uh, as God talked to Abraham back in Genesis 12. And then later on, Wesley uh, expands that and says this, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. What a great philosophy for living life, uh, to be generous, to be outgoing, to be helpful, uh, to look for ways to uh, do the most with 
the resources and, and uh, blessings that you have. Emotionally, uh, it's the same sort of trap that we get into. Uh, we think we have to follow a set of rules and laws for, for ourselves uh, uh, and for others. And we get exhausted trying to control people's uh, thoughts and attitudes and actions. Uh, and, and sometimes we even use the Bible to uh, give ourselves permission to do that, to lord over people that we have no right uh, to lord over. And it can be exhausting. Matthew 6, 31 says, Do seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will work out. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will work out. You can suspend the rules uh, uh, in order to find peace with yourself and with God. Trust in the Lord your God with all. And do not rely on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God, and God will direct your paths. That's the truth that Paul discovered. Not beating people into submission with a rule book, not weaponizing the, the scriptures, but trusting in God allowing God to be at work in people's lives and hearts, letting them come to the realization of what God might be trying to do in their lives, and trusting in that process instead of Paul having to be in charge of it. So against all hope, you know, I, I, I don't know what situations you may be facing, but a lot of times we face situations where we've tried and tried and tried. We've, we've tried to uh, control people and situations and events. Uh, we've tried to make things happen just on our sheer will. Uh, and it, it seems that Paul, after living that life and doing that himself, uh, has given us permission to give that up for Lent. Uh, to give up all of those rules and laws and, and uh, control uh, and just accept the grace of God, knowing that God is just invested, just as invested in all of this as you and I are, against all hope. It's not up to us all the time. Sometimes, if we put our trust in God, Seek God first. It's amazing how everything else finds its way. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for this day, for your work in our lives. I pray for folks today that are struggling between, in this place between law and grace. Um, Maybe it's, it's hard to give up control or to give up, well, everybody just has to follow these rules and that, that whole attitude and, and make this transition. It was hard for Paul to, uh, to, to walk towards Abraham and to recognize that uh, what God was doing was apart from the law. Uh, it was a different direction that, that Paul misread it uh, at the beginning. And he's thankful for this transformation. God, I pray for that transformation in our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear serve with commitment, 
And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.